In this message, we look at seven key aspects of ministering healing and deliverance from the ministry of Jesus and attempt to draw lessons that we can use in ministry. We talk about the will of God, the exercise of faith, the flow of compassion, the flow of the anointing, the issue of sin and salvation, the methods Jesus used, and the nature of supernatural healings. Be blessed. Okay, you ready to spend time in God's Word? Yes? Okay, I know it's very hot there. <laughs> stuffy. Let's stand to our feet, make a declaration, uh, and then we'll get into God's Word. So if you brought your Bible high up in the air, uh, put your Bible high up in the air and say this out loud, bold, and strong with me. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe his word and I live by his word. Christ is my master and to him I am an absolute surrender in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. All right. Uh, if you do not have a copy of this book, Ministering, Healing and Deliverance, uh, if you could kindly lift your hand up. Our, 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 uh, our ushers will come and quickly give you a copy of this book. Uh, just keep your hand up till you receive it and we'll get it out to you. Um, we'd uh, like for you to have a copy of this so that you could follow along. We're just using this uh, to study God's Word together. Our objective in, uh, in, in this whole series that we're spending about uh, three months on uh, uh, I'm sure there are also people outside who are, have their hands up, so if you could just attend uh, to people outside as well, that will be great. Thank you. Uh, our objective in this whole series here uh, is to uh, equip all of us in this whole area of ministering healing and deliverance. How do we bring healing and deliverance to God's people? So our objective here is to talk about this whole subject of healing and deliverance, for us to learn how to minister healing and deliverance to other people. And, uh, and, uh, and in the process, we also want to address uh, certain questions uh, that could have been, you know, that we've probably had in our minds a long time about this whole subject of healing, deliverance, address those questions, uh, provide answers from the Bible. This is what the Bible would say and speak uh, towards that question. And, and, and so talk about those things as we uh, go along. Um, we've covered up till um, chapter 2. And we are at the beginning of chapter 3, which is on page 105. The Father's works. Now, this morning, we will not, uh, or let me put it this way. This morning, we will do a quick run through chapter 3 because we actually talked about the Father's works uh, several months ago before we started this series on ministering, healing, and deliverance. We spent a couple of Sundays talking about the Father's work. So I don't want uh, to go through that whole message in detail. Just do a quick overview. And then we will spend our time this morning in chapter 4 when we talk about learning how to minister healing and deliverance from Jesus. So let's do a quick overview of chapter 3, the Father's works. And I just want to summarize that. You could follow along with me. I also want to encourage you uh, to please study this book at home. Study it. Study God's word. Uh, let it get into your heart. Uh, meet in small groups if you can and study the word of God together. Uh, if you want to start a prayer group and study it, that's great. Uh, use this resource as, as, as uh, uh, however you would like. All right, the Father's works. What we understand in Scripture is that the Lord Jesus said that He came in the Father's name to do 
the father's works he came to do the father's works and the father's works as he put it was the healings the deliverances the miracles that he did that's what he referred to as the father's works and there were certain things that jesus said about the father's works which are important and we want to look at it and also we want to look at the life of jesus and see how he walked with the father in order to do the father's works so that our goal must be i want to walk with the father the way jesus walked with the father so that i can also do the father's works so that's our motivation in studying this and and the fact is that uh, the lord jesus said this he said twice uh, once in john 17 and again in john 20 he said as my father sent me i am sending you meaning i'm sending you to do the same works that the father sent me to do so really you and i are called to do the father's works all of us so what did jesus say about the father's works uh, page 105 and moving forward from there uh, in page 106 and i'm just going to quickly uh, uh, review this he said on page 106 that from john chapter 5 that he said uh, the father's works were a more important witness to who he is or who he was than the testimony of john the baptist so john the baptist was the greatest old testament prophet and he pointed to jesus and said, jesus and said this is the lamb of god but jesus said the works i'm doing the father's works that i am doing are a more important testimony to who i am they're more important than the words of a prophet the father's works there was a time when john the baptist himself doubted on who jesus is i mean can you imagine you know here's john the baptist he's the one who baptized jesus in the river jordan he's the one who saw the uh, the, the 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 dove descending on jesus uh, he's the one who pointed to Jesus and said uh, Jesus and said this is the lamb of god he's the one who introduced jesus to the world and when john the baptist is put in prison he starts doubting and he sends word through his disciples saying are you the messiah or are we supposed to look for somebody else hey john this is a little too late now you know you already introduced jesus to the world it's too late to ask this question but can you imagine that a great prophet also doubted right makes you feel a little better okay <laughs> he doubted and how did jesus respond he didn't say hey john man don't you didn't you realize the dog coming down on me john don't you remember that don't you remember the voice that you heard saying this is my beloved jesus didn't even talk about any of that, those things the only response jesus sent back to john was john the blind see the lame walk the deaf hear the dead are raised the the the, the poor hear the gospel blessed is he who is not offended in me jesus pointed to the father's works even to john when he doubted he could have pointed to so many other things but he didn't he pointed to the father's works um page 108 Jesus said I must do the father's works and he talked about healing the uh, the blind man uh, in uh, in John 10 when the Jews came to Jesus and said tell us plainly are you the messiah um uh, page 109 uh, Jesus said the works I am doing they bear witness of me so when people asked him can you can you give us a proof well, you know are you the messiah tell us plainly he said look at the works they are pointing that i am the messiah he pointed to the father's works uh, as people questioned it even to his own disciples on page 109 in john 14 uh, even his own disciples after being with him for three and a half years they're asking questions like uh, you know jesus says you know i'm going to my father's house they're saying oh, you better give us the address because till today lord you've not shown us your father nor your father's house and now all of a sudden you're speaking things like do not let your heart be troubled i am going to my father's house 
and in my father's house there are many mansions but till today you haven't shown us the father nor the nor your father's house and you're telling us i'm going to the father. so give us the address jesus said i am the way the truth and the see it's in that context that he's saying i am the way the truth and the life and then they're not yet convinced and he says like just one thing show us the father now you're talking about the father's house and all that show us the father and then jesus says don't you realize if you've seen me you've seen the father and then in that context in john 14 he says if you you either believe me for what i'm saying or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves john 14 so even to his own disciples he says believe me for the sake of the works and then he says the works i am doing it's the father who dwells in me he does the works so believe me because of the works the healings the miracles so for jesus doing the father's works was very important and it was an important proof to the world to authenticate who he is or who he was the point i want to bear on our hearts is this that today we must see the father's works with that same kind of importance and we must desire for the father's works to be manifested so that the world can see that and believe in the lord jesus christ amen that's the same thing now the next part of that chapter is we talk about how did jesus walk with the father um we highlight several things in that chapter page 111 he was in the bosom of the father simply meaning he walked in the intimate presence of the father he spent time with the father intimacy with, with the father was very important for jesus to be with the father and out of that place of intimacy he revealed the father and so that calls you and me to walk with that kind of intimacy with god out of that intimacy with god we reveal him to the world uh page 112 he walked in the assurance of the father's love and it's important for us also to know that we are greatly loved by the father jesus said as my father loves me he loves you meaning the father loves you the same way he loves me and there is no difference there uh he drew strength from doing the father's will that was what motivated him that's what sustained him i'm doing the will of the father that energized him we must be energized with that same uh motivation I'm doing the will of the father. Page 114. Uh, uh he he said I do what I see the father do. Page 115, not my will, but the will of the father. Uh he said page 116 as my father teaches me, I speak it to the world and he walked in step and in timing with the father. Uh, uh so that's how he walked. He said I only do what I see the father do. I speak what I hear from the father. I walk in step and time with him. I follow his timing for my life where I go or I do uh, i'm just yielded to the father i do his will and uh, he was confident in prayer page 119 he said father i know you always hear me i believe you and i can walk in that kind uh, of prayer life now uh, with the father page 120 so you and i are called to walk with the father the way jesus did and are called to do his works you know we we've, we've gone through this before so i'm just quickly reviewing i read this chapter over and over again just to you know uh, motivate myself to encourage myself to say i must walk with the father the way jesus walked amen i want to encourage you to do that we are called to walk with the father the way jesus walked and to do the father's works the way jesus did so soak this chapter in just study it let it settle in your spirit the rest of the time we're going to go to chapter 4 which is where we're going to spend our time this morning i want to talk to us <clears throat> about learning to minister healing and deliverance from jesus that is we want to look at the way jesus ministered healing and deliverance kind of an overview of his ministry and learn some key facts some key things from his ministry i've borrowed the first five points uh from a sermon by Randy Clark uh some of you may know who Randy Clark is and he's uh, a healing a minister who ministers healing and um 
has an apostolic ministry uh, and he preaches a sermon over and over again called the thrill of victory uh, and that he mentions these five points the first five points uh, and then he uses illustrations from his ministry towards those points so what i did was i just borrowed those five points then i went back to the bible and i took out illustrations from the ministry of jesus and then formed uh, the message and then i added two more points to it but i think uh, these these seven points that we'll talk about this morning uh, gives us a little understanding of how to minister to people, right? Now, there are principles in the Bible based on which we should minister healing and deliverance. There are principles and we will mention them and we will study them further in the weeks to come. But, and we see Jesus ministering based on these principles. But what we also see is that there are times when he violates these principles. That means he goes outside of the boundaries of these principles and he does things, well, it's not according to what's the norm. We call them exceptions. So there are the norms by which we, God would work and we should normally move and operate by. But keep in mind, that there are exceptions. When God steps out of the norm and does something that we know is, is okay, this is not the normal way, there's an exception. And so when we minister, we also should be open to both. That means we would normally do it this way, but we were not locked into that norm because we know God's bigger than the rules he made. He will step out and do something exceptional. That's the sovereignty of God. He's just moving outside of those principles. And so we must be open and, and, and allow room for that as well. So let's talk about these seven things. Number one is the will of God. What do we see Jesus do concerning the will of God in his ministry as he ministered healing and deliverance? We see that, uh, you know, first of all, he eliminated any question about God's will through what he said and did. So if people had any doubts in their heart that maybe God's will is not to heal me, he got rid of that. There was a time when a leper came to Jesus and said, Lord, if it be your will, you can make me clean. And Jesus' immediate response was, I will be clean. So he said, see, I don't want you to even question my willingness. I am willing. So he eliminated any question about the will of God through what he said and did. And secondly, he demonstrated that God's will is to heal all who came to him in faith. So that's the norm. All who came to him in faith, he ministered healing. Like we said, he never made any excuses. Oh no, you should have come here yesterday, man, at the women's conference. The anointing was really strong, you know. He never made those kinds of excuses. Or, you know, man, today there's only 50 people God wants to heal. The first 50 get healed. The rest of you, too bad. See you tomorrow. None of those kinds of excuses. He never made any excuses. All who came to him in faith, he healed. And so the scripture records over and over again, he healed them all, everyone who came. So the only re the requirement there was all who came to him in faith. That's the norm. But yet, page 124, even though it was God's will to heal everyone, yet he did not heal at random. I mean, you don't see Jesus walking over to Jerusalem clinic, cleaning the place out, then going to Je Jerusalem hospital, cleaning all of them, and then going to, you know, the Jerusalem multi-specialty clinic, cleaning all of them. I mean, you don't see Jesus going randomly and just cleaning out all the places. You don't see him doing that. He did not heal at random. Was it God's will to heal everyone? Yes. But he healed those who came to him in faith. And he did not heal at random. For example, look at this. In John chapter 5, uh, Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda where the Bible says there's a number of sick people and uh, important people, paralyzed people lying around the pool. 
and he walks up to this one man and asks him will thou be made whole now this man is not even in faith and he is not even having any kind of faith because when jesus asks him do you want to be well he replies he says you know i don't have anybody take ready you know ready to carry me and throw me into the pool when the water is stirred none of that uh, he does what he responds he doesn't say oh you are the son of god you've been healing many people i've been reading about you in the newspaper i've been watching you on television you have come to me yes i'm ready to be healed he doesn't respond that way there's no faith nothing and yet he heals that one man he says rise take up your bed and walk the man is healed and then jesus leaves the place what about all the other people why not heal all the other people jesus response was he says later in that chapter in john chapter 5 verse 19 20 21 he says my father has been working and i also work the son can do nothing of himself except what he sees the father do so i do only what i see the father do so father wanted that one man heal heal walk away so he didn't heal at random so what's the norm the norm is god's will is to heal everyone and god will heal everyone who comes to him in faith so what must we do we must teach the word of god encourage faith in the hearts of people and encourage them to come and receive by faith that's the norm and yet we must understand that we don't heal at random we just simply don't go around randomly healing people and the exception is that sometimes even if people are not in faith god says i want that person healed you go and heal you minister to that person do you understand that so far you with me the next thing we talk about is the exercise of faith it's connected to what we just said faith and compassion are probably two most important things that you and i must have in our hearts as we minister to people and we encourage people to come in faith and so on page 126 you find over and over again the bible records that people came to him in faith and everyone who came to him in faith he ministered to them uh, you read about the roman centurion uh, the paralyzed man who was brought in by his four friends uh, you read about the woman with the issue of blood who touched the hem of his garment and jesus said your faith has made you well two blind men he said you know according to your faith be to you the woman from cana uh, jesus said daughter great is your faith and her daughter was healed uh, you know so many people who came to him in faith uh, received so that's the norm the norm is faith makes the connection we must have faith in god to receive that healing and we encourage faith in the hearts of people we also see that unbelief stopped the power of god so when jesus went to nazareth his hometown both in mark 6 and in matthew 13 the bible says he could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief he couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief so it stopped the power of god so that's the norm the norm is let's build faith by the preaching of god's word by the sharing of testimony encourage faith in their hearts encourage people to believe god and to receive healing and deliverance but there are exceptions the exception is that there are times when people have no faith and god still heals are you with me yes i know it's hot and tired sleep here oh, don't lose don't lose me there are times when there is no faith and god still heals so going back to the same paraly- uh, paralyzed man in john 5 jesus asked him will thou be made whole and his response is not one of great faith he just says i don't have anybody to put me in the water but that man is still healed then you remember the story of this man ah uh, uh, who brought his son who was lunatic you read about it in matthew 17 and and mark 9 ah uh, you know he has a bad experience because he brings uh, his son to the nine disciples of jesus three of them are with away with jesus he brings him to nine of them and they you know they must have all ganged around this guy and they couldn't deliver him so when jesus comes he's been he's he's had a bad experience with church already 
right? And, 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 and Jesus comes there and, 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 and he says, Lord, if you can do anything, please help my son. Jesus responds and says, if you believe, all things are possible to him who? believes." And then he says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Meaning, God, I mean, I tried with nine of your disciples, they couldn't do anything. So, I, so his faith was shaken at that moment. And Jesus still requires faith of him and he admits to unbelief. But the Lord still delivers that boy. So what's the point? The point is this. The norm is we must exercise faith in ministering, healing. We must encourage faith in, the, in people who come to receive healing. Encourage faith. But even if you don't, do not sense faith, great faith, even in your own self while you're ministering, or in the faith in the hearts of those who have come to receive healing, minister anyway. Because there are times when God just works out of that norm. God will move in spite of the lack of faith. There are times he does that. So still minister anyway. Sometimes you may not feel great, great faith. And somebody comes and says, look, this is the condition. You know, I've gone to, I've gone to you know, so many hospitals, so many doctors, and I've gone through all these people who prayed for me. And after every pastor has prayed for me, I've only become worse. So you know, I've come to you now. And like, when you hear that, those kind of stories, like your faith just goes out the window. Like, man, you've gone to all the best people. Now you're coming to me. What to expect? But what do you do? You just minister anyway. Even when you feel like you don't have that faith, just minister. Because there are times when God just moves in spite of the lack of faith. He moves. The norm is yes. God is asking us to work, operate by faith. But don't let that hold you back. <clears throat> Page 127. The flow of compassion. Here again, the same thing. The norm is that we minister out of compassion for people. So when you uh, minister to people, there's got to be love and compassion in your heart. And that's how Jesus ministered over and over again. You'll find the Bible saying Jesus was moved with compassion and he healed the sick. He was moved with compassion. He taught them the word. He was moved with compassion. He fed, um, the five, you know, he multiplied the five loaves and fish and he fed the thousands of people. He was moved with compassion for people and that motivated him. But what happens is you also find situations where, where this is on page 128, the exceptions, where there are times when Jesus most likely was not in a very compassionate mood. For example, imagine you know, you're coming up to service on Sunday morning and they give you so much problem of where you park the car. You go park the car and the Guy blows the whistle and says, move it there. And, and he's, he's like, man, does he know I'm the pastor, you know? <laughs> and, and then you move it there and he blows the car and says, no, move it that way. And, and, he, and by the time you've gone through that whole thing, there is no uh, sense of deep compassion, you know? <laughs> You're almost feeling like shouting at that guy, scolding the guy. You get out of your car, you bang the door, and then you're trying to get back in the state of spiritual feeling because now you've got to come and minister to people. You know, just imagine that. And that happened to Jesus, just a little differently. When he was going into the temple, he found all these money changers and people who sold dows at the entrance of the, of the temple. And then the, the next description is that Jesus overthrows these tables and he, he takes a whip and he, he's chasing them off. Now, don't tell me he went and gently pushed the table and... No, I think there must have been a lot of energy and emotion in that whole thing. Now most paintings of Jesus are paintings of Jesus the shepherd. You don't have even a single painting of Jesus with a whip, you know. That may not sell at all, you know. But that was fact. He must have been emotionally angry and upset with all these people doing all these things outside the temple and so you find Jesus doing this, this is in Matthew 21 what is the next thing you see Jesus do the Bible says he goes into the temple and imagine Jesus, you know he must have been sweating, all agitated all of that uh, and all his nice you know preacher's coat whatever he was wearing all in, uh, off the place and the Bible says the blind and the lame come to him in the temple and he healed them 
That wasn't a very compassionate moment. But he still ministered healing. Think of the time when the Canaanite woman comes to Jesus. You know, she must have sent him 150 SMSs. I'm coming, please pray for me. You know, and the disciples say, get out of the way. And she, she somehow makes her way past the disciple, comes to Jesus and she's troubling Jesus. And Jesus is speaking theology to her, you know. I am not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she's like, I don't care about your theology. I want my daughter healed, <laughs> you know. And, and finally, Jesus says, I can't take, you know, I can't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. And I says, forget it, dogs are no dogs. I want the crumbs that fall on the, you know. And it's not a very compassionate setting. Uh, you know, and yet at that moment, he ministers healing to this woman's daughter. So the point is this. The norm is you find Jesus ministering out of compassion, but you also find that there are moments when he was most likely not in a very compassionate frame of mind, and yet he still ministered healing to people. So, for you and I, what lesson can we take? Simple. When we minister to people, the norm is we must minister with great compassion. But, the fact is, when you have 50 people in a line waiting to be prayed for, the first 10 people, I mean, you put in a lot of energy, a lot of compassion, and you're done with 10, you're like, you feel like totally exhausted. God, 40 more to go. Saying, God, have mercy. You don't feel too much compassion. You just want to, you know, pray for all the 40. And you're just going through it. You may not feel a lot of compassion, but you still minister any way. Why? Because God still loves them. Regardless of how you feel, Regardless of what your emotional state is, God still loves them and he will minister to them. Right? So the flow of compassion, we must minister to compassion, but we human beings, we feel tired. Uh, there are time moments when you may be agitated emotionally, but you still minister. Why? Because sometimes in spite of the fact that you may not feel compassionate, there is a God in heaven who is very compassionate towards people. Amen? Are you with me? Learning? All right, a few more, I'll finish soon. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, 129, page 129. The same thing here. The norm is we depend on the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we uh, uh, attempt to create an environment that is full of faith and where we could sense the anointing of the Spirit and flow with the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the norm. But there are exceptions where there will be moments when you don't feel anything. You feel just totally natural. No sense of anointing. No sense of heavenly presence. And think of you know, many cases. There are times when the Bible says, for example, Luke 5.17, it says, you know, Jesus was ministering and the power of the Lord was present to heal. So the anointing was present. But then there are environments where Jesus ministered where you would never have felt any anointing. For example, he was walking through the dusty streets with all the crowds of people pressing around him. And you ask Jesus, you know, do you feel very anointed? He said, no, I'm really sweaty. All these people are bumping in me. I don't feel very anointed. There's no choir singing hallelujah. None of that. And yet in those moments, for example, this woman comes and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. The Bible says, virtue went out of him and healed her. So was that a very heavenly moment? Very anointed presence? Nothing. There's a crowded place with people bumping at Jesus and it must have been dusty and hot and everything. And yet, in that moment, the power of the Holy Spirit went through him. And like that, you have many instances. There's another time when Jesus was in the house and, and, and there were all these Pharisees and they're all sitting and trying to find fault with Jesus. And he, you know, he probably felt a hostile environment. And Jesus was grieved in his spirit because of the kind of people around him. And yet in that place, he tells a man with a withered hand, stretch out your hand, and he heals him. So what's the message here? The message is simple. There are times, whenever possible, we try to create an atmosphere 
for the Holy Spirit to move. We try to sing the right song. We try to get people in faith. We try to come prayer and all of that. Have the right atmosphere so that we can, we can have an atmosphere conducive to the moving of the Spirit. And that's good. But you will not always get that. Most of the time you won't get that. Most of the time you'll be out there on the street. You'll be in your office, in your college, some place where you cannot call, you know, the, let me get the worship team to play the right song. Nobody's there. You are there. The office people are there. They have all these questions about the Bible. And you need to pray and minister. So even when you and I do not feel anointed or feel the anointing of the Spirit, we minister anyway because God's Spirit works through us independent of our feeling and our sensing of His presence. Amen? So you minister anyway. Don't worry whether you feel anointed or not. How about the issue of sin and salvation? 131. How about that? What we see in the ministry of Jesus is this. There are times he heals the person and then deals with the issue of sin. There are other times when he deals with the issue of sin first and then heals the person. And there are many cases where he just doesn't talk about it. He just ministers healing. For the, for the man in John 5, the crippled man that he healed, he healed him first and later on he told him, go and sin no more lest a worse thing come on you. So he healed him first and then dealt with the issue of sin. For the paralyzed man was brought in by his four friends. The first thing he said was, Son, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, Rise, take up your bed and walk. So in that case, he dealt with sin first, then ministered healing. And in many cases, he never even addresses that. He just ministers healing. What's the point? The point is this. Don't create a formula saying, first they have to be saved, only then they will get healed. Jesus didn't do that. He did it both ways. So sometimes when you're ministering to a person, you may just minister healing first, then Deal with the issue of sin and salvation. Sometimes you may deal with the issue, and, uh, the issue of sin and salvation first. And then minister healing and deliverance. There is no fixed formula. Both are open. Do whatever the situation permits you to do. Of course we know that salvation is ultimately the thing that we are going after. We want the person to be saved. And so we will not neglect that. As far as healing and deliverance is concerned, it can happen both ways. Either way. Are you with me so far? Yes? Majority, all the people that Jesus healed in his earthly ministry were not saved. Nobody could be saved until Jesus died on the cross. So he still healed them. He didn't make salvation as a requirement for healing. Last two points. I'll be done quickly. The methods Jesus used... You do not find Jesus using only one method to heal people. He used all kinds of things. There are times he lays, hand, he lays his hand on people. He touches people. There are times people touch him or touch his garments. There are times people, Jesus tells people, rise, take up your bed. and it, you know, He tells them to do something. Sometimes he, he just declares a word saying, it's done. Go home. Your son lives. Uh, there are times he spits on the ground, he makes clay and he puts it on a blind man's eyes. He didn't heal all blind men that way, just now and then he did that. There are times he put his spit, touched his tongue and he put his spit on another man, dumb, mouth, dumb man's tongue, started speaking. There are times he stuck his fingers into the deaf man's ears to bring healing. So he did it in so many different ways. There's no set method that he fixed himself. So what's the point? The point is this. As far as methods, just do whatever you can. Whatever is available at that moment. If it's convenient to lay hands, lay hands. If it's not convenient to lay if you cannot lay hands on the person, it's okay. Just speak healing from a distance. That's also fine. If you, uh, if you want to pray over the phone, that's fine. If you want to pray over a cloth and send it, that's fine. Whatever. Right? It's not the method that's important. 
It's the Lord who brings healing. The last thing, the nature <coughs> of supernatural healing. This is page 135. Whenever Jesus ministered, we see that his healing, his ministry, except other than one recorded instance, the healings were immediate, they were complete, they were verifiable, and they always glorified God. So they were immediate. Immediately, people were healed. They were complete. They were completely cured. They were verifiable. Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. Let him check you out. And they glorified God. Now, we understand that when today when we pray, we may not see that same standard of healings. Some of we prayed, it takes some time for people to be healed. Sometimes they receive partial healing, all of that. But our goal is to press in to the same standard that Jesus ministered in. Amen? And we say, Lord, if that's the way you did it, we want to do it the same way. We want to rise up to that standard. We want to keep pressing in until we see those same kinds of things. Right? We want to see healings that are immediate, they're complete, they're verifiable, and of course they bring glory and honor to God. Amen? Tell a neighbor, he's finally done. <laughs> All right, so what did we learn? Oh no, he's going to review. <laughs> what did we learn? From the healing ministry of Jesus, about the will of God, Yes, it is God's will to heal everyone. But we don't just heal at random. We invite people to come and receive by faith. Oh, concerning faith, yes, the norm is people must have faith. But then there are exceptions when even when there's a lack of faith, we minister, God still heals. The flow of compassion. That's the norm for us to minister of compassion. But... Uh, there are times when we don't feel compassion, we still minister. The anointing of the Spirit, the norm is we try to feel the anointing and minister according to the anointing. But sometimes you don't feel anything. You minister anyway because the Holy Spirit can flow through your life. You, the issue of sin and salvation, sometimes you talk about it before, sometimes you talk about it after. It doesn't matter. God can do it both ways. Uh, the methods, God uses any kind of method. Don't, don't limit yourself to only one way of ministering healing. And the healings, the nature of healing, we want to press it, press into the same standard that Jesus had. Amen? Let's stand to our faith. So the encouragement here this morning is, while there are norms that we work, by, work with <clears throat> when we minister healing and deliverance, there are always exceptions. As we move ahead in the weeks to come, We'll talk about some of the practical ways you and I can minister healing and, and I encourage you to do that. And as we talk about these things, keep in mind that we're not locking ourselves into any method, particular way. Because there are norms, but there are also exceptions. God is bigger than, 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 than the things that we, we say he would normally do. He's bigger than that. He works uh, outside of that as well. And so we want to be open to the way God works. Let's call our worship team up and we'll just take a few moments to pray close. I just want you to pray this morning that God would use you to bring healing, to bring his healing and his deliverance to people around you. That God would use you to say, God, I want to be used by you to bring your healing and deliverance to people. Our city needs to see the greatness of our God. <clears throat> and we must demonstrate Jesus in the city. So would you pray and say, God, use me. Father, we just pray this morning that even as we study, as we learn <clears throat> on how to minister healing and deliverance, God. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you will use each one of us. Set up opportunities, just create things in our lives that we will be able, Lord, to demonstrate the power of God, to see people healed and delivered. That mighty things will take place even through our lives. 
God in just normal everyday settings, whether it's in our schools or in our offices or God out on the street or in the malls, wherever God in normal everyday settings, that you will empower us, you will work through us to bring healing and deliverance, Father. That all of us will come back with stories, with testimonies of seeing God work through our lives. That seeing God use simple people to do mighty things. Father, we pray you will use each one of us. Stir our hearts up, O oh God. Stir our hearts up. Even as we go from this place through the course of this week, we pray you'll use us, Lord. Use us even more. Use us even more. Even more, God. We just pray and say, God, use me even more to touch lives, to bring healing, to bring deliverance, to see people come into the kingdom of God. Use me. Use me, God. Father, we just thank you. And also right now, we just, let's take a moment just to pray for God's healing. And in this place, I want to encourage you to put your hand on your body. The place that you want God to touch. If it's possible, could you do that? If there's a need in your body, just put your hands on that part of your body where you need God to touch and heal. Just as an act of your faith and, and say, Lord, I... I want your healing words to flow through this part of my body to bring healing here and bring deliverance here, God. Just, just do that if it's possible. Put your hand on that part of your body you want God to touch. And let's just pray. Let's pray together. I want everyone just praying here, saying, God, let your healing words flow in this place. Lord, let your healing words flow in this place. Father, even this place, over everyone who needs healing, we ask for your healing to flow. We ask for sickness and disease to be removed. And healing to come, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. <clears throat> we just ask for your healing to come. Let there be healing in the name of Jesus. Command tumors and growths just to disappear in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Command tumors and growth just to dematerialize and leave bodies right now in the name of Jesus. Let a healing flow, oh God, even through joints. And where arthritis has just affected those joints, let a healing flow releasing people from all the pain let that yoke of arthritis be broken and I rebuke that spirit of arthritis in Jesus name release, be released be released now in the name of Jesus Lord let your healing words flow let your healing words flow God let your healing words flow and every, every other condition that we may not have named but God you know the need we ask for your healing we thank you God we thank you, Father. We thank you. We bless you, God. We praise you. Praise you. Let's just sing a song. I believe you're my healer. And then after we close, I believe you're my healer. We sing that. And I believe. You're my healer, and I believe you are all I need. I sing it all, and you believe you're my portion, and I believe. You're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all. 
and I will leave your body. Father, we just thank you for what's been done, even in this place this morning. We give you thanks, and we give you the praise, because you are, O oh God, our healer, the one who makes us whole. We thank you, in Jesus, in Jesus' mighty name, thank you. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you, lift up his countenance on you, and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We'll be back in our regular auditorium next week. God bless. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.